Hi, welcome to Reality Check. My guest today is Vajahat Aziz. Uh, Vajahat is the ML and HPC leader for healthcare and life sciences at AWS. And today we're going to discuss uh, the uh, healthcare pre predominantly and the use of generative AI in healthcare. Vajahat, welcome to the channel and uh, thank you very much for accepting my invitation to speak about this important topic. And uh, before we start and before we dive in gen generative AI, can you tell us um, uh, your story um, and what drives you uh, every day uh, to, to work on healthcare uh, and AWS? Thanks, Ilya. Um, yeah, so I've been in the technology space for the, about, about 15 years now. I started off as a software engineer working across different industries, travel, oil and gas, etc. I ended up working for a life sciences company about 12 years ago, which was my first introduction uh, to this domain. And I found it quite impactful in terms of how technology can shape and uh, make innovations and uh, in, in terms of innovations, how it can really impact the delivery of healthcare, the quality of care. Uh, the potential it has in terms of changing the landscape of uh, with regards to developing new drugs, etc. So I've been quite passionately uh, following uh, this journey over the last 12 years, working for a number of different life sciences companies. And um, in the last four years, I've worked with AWS, uh, working uh, for uh, with a number of uh, biotech and pharma customers where uh, we're helping them develop uh, AI uh, and data-driven uh, workloads for a wide variety of um, challenges across the value chain from drug discovery to commercial um, and uh, kind of how to market drugs and make make them uh, readily available to, to patients across the globe. Thank you. Uh, we all had been living with some form of machine learning or AI for a long time. But about a year ago, uh, there was a huge explosion of interest to this field um, after the introduction of OpenAI ChatGPT. And everybody is talking about this. So what's your view, whether it's just a hype or you believe this is going to change our lives forever? Um, I think what people need to remember is that um... Uh, applications like ChatGPT didn't come out of a vacuum. This has been a development in working um, over the last few years with the uh, innovations we've seen in machine learning, how uh, scalable compute has became uh, become readily available, the explosion of data. So all the convergence of all these different developments in technology has led to um, a, a space where we have now models which are a lot more uh, capable in terms of performing different types of complex tasks. And uh, we've been able to develop and train such models. And this, ha especially in healthcare and life sciences, given the increase in health data, health organizations across the globe have been constantly modernizing their data infra infrastructure, unifying their data and innovating faster with advanced analytics and machine learning. And we've seen this across different industries. Uh, so what we've seen with regards to chat GPT is just, uh, um, an illustration of uh, how machine learning can significantly change the game. And uh, with large language models in particular, it's not just about applications like question answer interfaces or chatbots, but also how large language models can be leveraged to perform other complex tasks. And we've seen that in the life sciences uh, space where uh, protein models, uh, protein language models have been used in the drug discovery space to identify new drug candidates and so on. So uh, I think, uh, uh, Gen AI has the potential to significantly change the landscape, uh, both in technology and in different industries and domains. And we're seeing uh, that play out in healthcare and life sciences specifically. And this year, we've been working with a number of uh, customers where we've seen uh, some really impactful uh, use cases where Gen AI can really uh, make a difference. Great. Uh, on the drug discovery, I recently had an interview with Paul Agapo, and we talked about this. So let's try to focus on the healthcare uh, space. Mm -hmm. Which uh, key use cases do you see uh, for Gen AI in uh, healthcare? So I think the key focus right now is on improving patient outcomes, making better decisions faster, and accelerating therapeutic development. 
And um, organizations are starting to uh, experiment with and work with generative AI and how they can uh, use generative AI to help, for example, fill in missing medical data uh, in life sciences or healthcare data sets, uh, enhancing therapeutic development, how generative AI models can be used to create synthetic data sets so that it can be used for healthcare research because a lot of healthcare data uh, resides in uh, silos because of uh, patient privacy concerns, et cetera. It's not easily accessible for research organizations or uh, organizations who are uh, working in this space to analyze this data to identify certain patterns to be able to, uh, for example, de uh, detect uh, uh, for disease detection, etc. In terms of also operational efficiencies, uh, Gen AI can be realized to identify waste, uh, which results as a result of manual workloads or mistakes people make while documenting patient records and so on. Uh, you can also potentially use generative AI to uh, identify rare diseases, provide recommendations for treatment, and speed up diagnosis. And then there are a lot of other uh, promising developments uh, that you will potentially see in the future focused on, for example, personalized medicines, where uh, further improvements and advancements in these models coupled with better availability of data can lead to um, uh, technology being used as a means to tailor uh, treatments based on a patient's uh, genetic makeup, for example. Um, additionally, uh, some uh, other use cases around uh, disease prediction or rare disease identification, et cetera, can be uh, uh, successfully uh, targeted using uh, uh, advanced AI, generative AI capabilities. Well, this is very interesting. So uh, if I will ask you to name top three use cases. So imagine yourself being a startup. Mm -hmm. And you want to build a gen AI based solution for uh, the um, uh, healthcare. First of all, will you uh, uh, build a startup in the healthcare field? And secondarily, which top three use cases you would focus on? Which top three problems you will be solving for healthcare using gen AI? Um, yeah, so I think there's certainly is it is a promising opportunity uh, starting uh, a, a business or startup focusing on healthcare uh, challenges or use cases and there are certain areas where a startup can certainly make an impact one of them is for example around uh, operational efficiencies uh, that, that i kind of uh, uh, alluded to earlier so we have seen where uh, uh, customers are trying to automate certain processes so that uh, providers and people involved in del healthcare delivery can focus, um, spend a lot more time focusing on patients rather than performing manual work, documentation, et cetera. So one example of that is using generative AI to capture interaction between patients and providers and uh, generating insights, which could then be transformed into um, healthcare records, which will free up the providers uh, to spend more time with the patients, talking to them, listening to their concerns, focusing on uh, areas that they, they need to focus on as part of their uh, delivery of care, rather than spending a lot more time typing into um, you know, um, a system or taking all the notes during the, those interactions. And we've seen this play out uh, with uh, 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 working with some customers, as well as th there are some startups I've seen in this space we are, which are trying to automate part of this process using generative AI or even traditional machine learning mo models uh, using mechanisms like named entity recognition, et cetera. Um, there are other areas where startups can certainly provide, uh, uh, bring acceleration to some of the uh, uh, friction or inertia we're seeing in terms of uh, adoption of generative AI in healthcare. One is around regulatory compliance, because, which is a big issue for uh, a lot of these large organizations who have legacy systems, we have uh, uh, information silos sitting in different areas, et cetera. And uh, as we have seen with uh, some of the new directives coming out, like, like the EU AI Act, uh, there is a requirement to make the end-to-end -end process of training these models more transparent. Uh, provenance is a, a kind of at the heart of that, et cetera. So how do you enable these organizations to build uh, these AI applications in a regulated environment where it, they're meeting all these transparency and compliance requirements, there's an opportunity to build a framework that can help these organizations accelerate uh, the path to development and production for, for such applications. 
the question that I have for you is, um, uh, I would expect that this uh, uh, compliant environment will be built by the large companies like AWS, um, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this will be less the job of a startup, <clears throat> but more uh, a job of environment where you train uh, your model. Is that correct assess uh, statement? So a machine learning training environment typically provides you with the right tools and um, capability that you potentially need to ensure compliance with regulations. The enforcement of those uh, policies is another matter. It's primarily business process driven on how an organization approach uh, uh, those compliance requirements. And that's where uh, you could... Uh, using certain technology tools automate part of those processes. So for example, assessing whether uh, certain access control requirements are being met or um, how to ensure that end-to-end -end, uh, that provenance of uh, from the origin of data to the delivery of the model, how data is being captured, uh, modified, used, et cetera. Um, AWS uh, and companies like AWS do provide the set of tools or the building blocks to build such uh, capabilities but uh, they don't typically provide their end-to-end -end turnkey solutions. And I think in terms of providing those turnkey solutions, there's an opportunity for startups or smaller businesses to build solutions around that. Great, thank you. Uh, well, Rajahat, uh, I'm sure you saw a lot of different um, uh, deployments of uh, Gen AI-based solutions um, in the real world. Can mm -hmm. you talk about a few examples which impressed you most uh, in terms of the actual use of Gen AI and uh, what are the customers, what kind of customer needs and problems uh, this type of solution solved and uh, what were the results of the deployment of Gen AI solutions? So a majority of the solutions we have seen in this space have been focused more around uh, process automation, achieving operational efficiency, et cetera. Uh, we haven't seen uh, widespread use of generative AI in areas which could be considered uh, uh, more in kind of in the realm of regulated uh, use cases around healthcare delivery, et cetera. Majority of the customers that we're working with, they're focusing more on experimenting with generative AI in this space to see what potential generative AI has to offer. Use cases where we've seen uh, adoption of generative AI in terms of uh, actually the solutions being moved to production is where they can uh, bring more efficiencies to the uh, current processes, uh, whether it's concerning healthcare delivery or whether it's around documentation or administrative tasks, et cetera. So one example is uh, we've seen uh, the uh, increased use of design patterns like retrieval augmented generation, where these systems are being made available to uh, uh, people in in uh, in the healthcare delivery settings, which can give them easy access to information that will otherwise take them a long time to retrieve and digest and uh, and analyze. So one example could be uh, uh, in in uh, in a healthcare setting, you might have uh, a, a large. Uh, knowledge base that provides you information about uh, your administrative processes, for example, on uh, how to uh, perform triage and, and so on and so forth. And uh, people can uh, simply ask questions about uh, re relevant questions about the process and the LLMs, the large language models can give them accurate answers based on the knowledge base that, it, that they're, they're using. Um, in addition to that, uh, we've also seen uh, adoption of uh, generative AI in areas like uh, where field services, which are um, uh, working with hel uh, healthcare sites to maintain their equipment, et cetera, can access uh, information con uh, re related to those uh, de medical devices that they are servicing or repairing, how they can access uh, relevant information about the product and uh, certain information about how to troubleshoot these applications and so on effectively. Um, in the healthcare setting itself, uh, we have seen some adoption of generative AI. So one example is uh, this service that AWS recently announced called HealthScribe, which is capable of capturing patient-doctor interaction. And uh, it documents that interaction based on the voice notes or 
uh, live voice feed that you provide to the application and it generates insights in, in, in real time uh, to identify certain uh, key um, pieces of information as part of the interaction like what uh, comorbidities were identified uh, or uh, what dosage or what ma medication a patient is on and so on. Uh, and we've seen the adoption of that service by some of our uh, customers. Uh, and uh, there's a, a lot of in interest in terms of how this can be used in a wide variety of uh, healthcare delivery settings. Interesting. Uh, you know, I was always curious. Um, I think the interaction between patient and the doctor is a little bit outdated these days. So it's been always that the patient comes, doctor looks at the patient, and based on the current status of the patient, makes a decision. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, our decision making became more complex. Now uh, the doctor can look at the blood test results and uh, um, read the history of the patient disease. But uh, I would expect that uh, we can collect data from ourselves on the regular basis for a long, longer period of time. And this long time, long term data should give us much better insights than uh, a five minute interaction with the doctor uh, and the patient. Uh, what, what's your view on that? So, uh, are there like technological advances that can help uh, collect more data, longer term data to make better informed decisions? Um, yes, so there has been uh, some uh, development in this space. So we have this concept of uh, longitudinal patient data where we bring data of uh, of a patient together based on their historical interaction with uh, a physician. Uh, so that longitudinal view of the patient allows you to look at what uh, different uh, events or episodes the patient has been through, what interactions they had with different physicians over time, what medications they were prescribed, what their trajectory has been in terms of the different uh, uh, medical events they have been through, etc. And uh, being able to analyze that information in real time can provide a physician uh, really good insight in terms of their current state of health, what their history has been, and so on. And this is where generative AI can be significantly, uh, um, uh, considerably useful. Um, so, you, for example, you can retrieve all that historic patient data uh, before an appointment, asking an LLM to kind of summarize that patient history and couple that with other uh, modalities like any x-ray images or CT scans, et cetera, that you might have in your EHR system, along with any related publicly available information related to some of the health issues they had to uh, and ask the model to kind of give you an overview of what uh, the patient history is and uh, uh, which could potentially better prepare you to engage with the patient when you start interacting with the patient uh, themselves. And in, in addition to that, while you're having that interaction, so services like Health Trans uh, HealthScribe can uh, further enhance that uh, experience by potentially coupling uh, the data generated as part of the interaction with the historical data set to help you uh, shape a more informed view of the patient's current state. I really like this idea. Uh, I think uh, the prep time before the visit to the doctor is super important for both doctor and the patient. Yeah, uh, I believe there is a space for a solution where the, the patient based on the past history of the patient, can be asked questions prior to the visit by the LLM model. And uh, the summary and the answers to these questions will come uh, to the doctor's view prior to the visit of the patient. And uh, only live interaction will, uh, will be like productive time uh, yeah. for the doctor-patient. And everything else uh, is done before before the visit, visit. Yeah. Uh, I really uh, uh, despise the fact that you come to the doctor, you have to fill the paper form. This is just complete nonsense uh, these days. It, it, yeah, it's, it's a bit outdated. So much, so much beyond uh, what we are doing. And each form is different. So I don't understand why uh, we keep doing this. So yeah, there's so, so much space for improvement. This is potentially a good uh, business idea for a startup. You build an app that uh, essentially 
asks a series of questions to a patient before their appointment, given the nature of the appointment, they've customized or personalized those questions. And perhaps based on the responses, the LLM further adapts the follow-up questions to get better insights from the patient to uh, provide the physician the best uh, uh, you know, insight, as, as, as best insight as possible before the appointment. Excellent. Uh, so once we're done with the interview, we'll go and start building the startup. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, agreed. So uh, when you see the deployments of Gen AI, <clears throat> what are the outcomes uh, for uh, the doctors, uh, for the patients, for the clinics? Um, do you uh, see uh, any financial results from these deployments? So far, uh, what we have seen is the focus has been mainly on uh, operational efficiency, which essentially means uh, uh, potential to reduce cost and uh, overall administrative burden on uh, healthcare providers. And uh, that's where uh, we are starting to see significant improvements in terms of uh, the automation brings a significant reduction to uh, the amount of uh, 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 manpower you need to maintain some of these processes and workflows. Um, so one example, uh, which is not directly relevant to healthcare is uh, around um, how some of the uh, pharma uh, uh, and biotech companies are looking at using Gen AI to create content to engage with patients and providers better in a, uh, using more personalized engagement messaging and so on. And that process typically requires employing a lot of people, hiring agencies, takes a very long cycle of around two to three months to pr produce new content and, and a significant uh, uh, investment in, in terms of uh, cost as well. And uh, what we are seeing in, in, with the use of generative AI is it is not only significantly reducing that cycle of developing this content and providing better personalization, but also uh, significantly reducing the amount of uh, uh, time and uh, manpower they need to build build these uh, such content. Cool. Uh, I see that you had been working on the transformative strategies for pharma and startups. So with the uh, advancement in Gen AI, how do you see these transformations happening uh, for the pharmaceutical and startup companies working in this space? So um, I think for pharma and uh, startups in the life sciences space, the potential for generative AI is quite vast uh, and it spans across the whole value chain. So starting from areas like disease gene identification, where you can analyze large scale um, omics uh, like genomic data sets and identifying patterns or cor correlations between genetic variants and disease phenotypes to areas like clinical trials where you can potentially use generative AI to predict uh, efficacy of new compounds and uh, their possible side effects, as well as identify most suitable patient population for specific trials. Um, also in, in the manufacturing space where you can utilize these models uh, to train on historical data to uh, uh, identify or better understand machine usage and maintenance logs to identify patterns and links between various factors such as temperatures, vibrations, operating hours, et cetera, which can lead to better implementation of uh, what we call uh, predictive maintenance solutions, for example. And also in the commercial space, as I said, uh, patient support can be customized using generative AI by analyzing patient data to identify patterns related to gen uh, genetics, uh, lifestyle, and environment, allowing doctors to proactively predict uh, a patient's risk profile. Um, as well as uh, enabling farmers to better engage with patients and uh, providers both in, in a more meaningful way using personalized messaging and uh, uh, better in, in interactions overall with, with their stakeholders. You, you know, uh, we uh, just agreed that we are going to build our startup. Um, <laughs> and, uh, what worries me though, uh, before I just go and invest time and money in this space, is that uh, healthcare space is super regulated. Mm -hmm. And uh, it takes enormous amount of time to build the compliance solutions. So with that in mind, uh, I want you to ask a question from my previous speaker uh, who asked, how much should we constrain the AI development? 
because now we are looking at the uh, regulations and constraints of the uh, healthcare field, plus regulations and constraints of AI. So what's your view on this? Uh, we keep regulating, we keep uh, making solutions more difficult than more uh, ex uh, expensive. Um, yeah, I think regulation is a bit of a balancing act and it's very hard to get it right. Uh, the EU has attempted to do that with GDPR, for example, and the recent introduction of the EU's AI legislation is perhaps another attempt. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it's important to note that uh, some of the developments we've seen with the likes of OpenAI with their boardroom drama recently, there is a need to regulate the industry in, in a sense that uh, the power shouldn't get concentrated in the hands of a few and uh, it should be a level playing field for all to be able to um, leverage the advancements in technology. Um, having said that, um, regulation often creates uh, additional um, burdens in terms of costs, in terms of uh, administrative overhead, etc. for organizations who are trying to innovate in this space, especially in the uh, domains like healthcare and life sciences. Um, so I think it's a, a matter of finding the right balance in terms of how do we protect uh, civil liberties and certain concerns around um, uh, 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 discriminatory practices, et cetera, but at the same time, enable organizations to innovate faster and uh, bring these uh, innovations to market as, as quickly as possible. Um, I think... Uh, the, the landscape will evolve uh, in, in the next uh, few years as uh, we, see, we see more advancements in AI and people become more educated about AI in terms of the potential it has to offer. Currently, there's a lot of uh, this fear factor that AI is going to take everyone's uh, jobs and it's going to uh, cause a lot of disruptions, which it potentially would. But at the same time, it will bring uh, some significant uh, changes in a positive way to how we... Uh, 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 approach certain uh, problems and challenges. So there's an opportunity there. And uh, it's all about how do we focus on the opportunity without uh, 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 while ensuring that certain bad actors do not uh, exploit uh, some of these capabilities which can be used in harmful ways. Interesting. So what's your view on what's the most dangerous uh, use of AI. So what use of AI you would um, consider a uh, threat uh, for humanity? Um, I think the biggest concern that a lot of people have is around how certain state actors can use AI and ML to um, create capabilities that significantly uh, disrupt uh, our ability to uh, yeah, uh, practice uh, our freedoms that we have today. And we're seeing some of those uh, play out in certain parts of the world already where increased surveillance and uh, more uh, kind of highly uh, controlled environments where freedom of speech is compromised, etc. And that's something which is, which is a real concern. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the fact that certain large uh, players uh, are dominating this space uh, or potentially would dominate this space is, is also a concern because uh, I personally think the open source community plays a uh, massive role in how the technology advances and evolves over time because contribution from a number of different uh, stakeholders uh, and that collaborative contribution is quite important and that's what we have seen uh, in, in, in terms of how uh, certain uh, developments in AI have happened over the last few years in terms of the transformer models, different app implementations of uh, the transformer architecture, different types of applications or use cases that people have uh, demonstrated how AI can be used in, uh, in certain positive ways. So preserving that is very important and uh, pr um, ensuring that the um, intellectual um, property and the, the, the knowledge of how to continue, uh, continually in, evolve uh, or make advancements in this space is not concentrated in the hands of a few. Thank you.
um, a very insightful uh, view. Uh, one of my past uh, speakers when we discussed this topic uh, was also mentioning the ability of with the use of Gen AI to manipulate people's um, uh, thoughts and decisions and creating fake reality uh, becoming so easy and so inexpensive that mm -hmm. we are uh, we, we need to have with school a new topic how to distinguish between reality and fake reality. I think yes. that's an that's... Import, important sub subject for us to learn. Maybe even build the uh, AI model that will help us to distinguish between fake and real. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, my uh, a regular question to all my speakers is, uh, what do you want to ask my next speaker uh, uh, with regards to generative AI? Yeah, I think uh, my question would be more uh, in the uh, from a regulatory perspective. What do they see the impact of the EU AI Act on the development uh, uh, progression progress uh, in in this space going forward, and how do they uh, foresee other regions uh, uh, react responding to this? Whether they were introduced their own set of leg legislations which are in line with the EU AI Act, or there will be a divergence on how different uh, parts of the world regulate um, AI going forward. Perfect. I will definitely ask this question. I am uh, also planning to have a follow-up uh, interview with one of my past uh, guests. Uh, who uh, is uh, ethics AI or AI ethics assessor. And um, uh, I want to talk to him about the uh, impact of uh, EU AI Act uh, mm -hmm. on the businesses. Uh, this is definitely a very important uh, topic uh, of today. Vajahat, mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, for taking your time. I uh, really enjoyed um, our conversation and uh, I wish you and uh, AWS um, a lot of um, uh, luck and patience and uh, ideas uh, to build new Gen AI solutions that will make our lives better and specifically healthcare. It's in this such a need for improvement uh, today. Certainly. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay. Bye.